Good morning and welcome to Palm Sunday, a day of arrival, a day remembered for a parade and for a people gathering to offer Jesus their glad hosannas. The people of First United Methodist Church are delighted that you are joining us for this online service of prayer and celebration. Today's worship team has gathered in one place to record a live broadcast, the first time in a year. We are gathering in the social hall because it will be a safer location when we begin to gather in person next week and for the next several weeks. I am grateful to Reverend Ed Evans who will be offering today's sermon. Rosanna Yates Bailey will be leading the liturgy. Judy and Emo Moylanen, the hymns, accompanied by Kristen Quigley Bry, who will be offering prelude and postlude music. And Aaron Simmons, our deacon, who will be leading us in prayer. Welcome, one and all, to this service of prayer and celebration. Please join me in this call to worship from the Church of Scotland. At this point in our Lenten journey, we find ourselves in Jerusalem. We, we greet you, Jesus, Jesus, humble and riding on a donkey, moving from the countryside to the corridors of power. We salute you, O Christ. You are giving the beast of burden a new dignity you are giving majesty a new face. You are giving those who long for redemption a new song to sing. With heart and voice we shout, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. be with you and also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, who on this day entered the rebellious city that later rejected you, we confess that our wills are as rebellious as Jerusalem's, that our faith is often for show 
rather than substance, that our hearts are in need of cleansing. Have mercy on us, Son of David, Savior of our lives. Help us to bring what we have and all that we are, trusting you to forgive what is sinful, to heal what is broken, to welcome our praises, and to receive us as your own. Amen. Today's psalm reading is from number 118, verses 1 to 2 and 19 to 29, from Eugene Peterson's The Message. Thank God because he's good, because his love never quits. Tell the world, Israel, his love never quits. Swing wide the city gates, the righteous gates. I'll walk right through and thank God. This temple gate belongs to God, so the victors can enter and praise. Thank you for responding to me. You've truly become my salvation. The stone the masons discarded as flawed is now the capstone. This is God's work. We rub our eyes. We can hardly believe it. This is the very day God acted. Let's celebrate and be festive. Salvation now. Salvation now. Oh, yes, God, a free and full life. Blessed are you who enter in God's name. From God's house, we bless you. God is God. He has bathed us in light. Festoon the shrine with garlands. Hang colored banners above the altar. You're my God, and I thank you. Oh, my God, I lift high your praise. Thank God. He's so good. His love never quits. Today's gospel reading is from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. And then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their shulks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
here we are, back in God's house, it seems, and it's so good to be here. Please pray with me for a moment. Spirit of God, fall afresh upon this place, and may your spirit touch each of us in every way possible, so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be with you. Amen. Brother Mickey McGrath is an oblate of St. Francis de Sales. He's a writer, a speaker, an extraordinary artist, and I'm privileged to call Mickey a friend. Mickey loves to explore the relationship between art and faith. His art and ministry have been featured in a number of national publications, including USA Today, as well as Catholic publications, numerous publications all across the country. Carolyn and I traveled with Mickey on a pilgrimage to Ireland in 2004 to explore that relationship between art and faith. We visited a whole number of sacred sites and ruins scattered throughout Ireland. So as I was putting together thoughts about this Palm Sunday liturgy, I was reminded of one of Mickey's images that I'd like to share with you. I hope you can see this, it's a nun washing a pile of dirty dishes, lifting one of them up high above a sink of hot steaming water. It's a beautiful image. It's a holy gesture. It's a prayer, lifting the dishes and giving thanks to God. A holy gesture offered as she was participating in the most mundane of tasks. Stick with me on this one. The nun is Saint Teresa of Lisieux. The image is from Mickey's book, uh, Journey with Teresa of Lisieux. The point of the image is to be aware of the presence of God in the most unexpected places. Places like standing over a kitchen sink washing the dishes. Or as in the story today from Saint Mark's Gospel, fetching donkeys. You remember that story, don't you? You just heard it a moment ago. It said colt in the text that we heard just a moment ago from the version that I was working with today. It said donkey, so we'll go with that one for now. As Jesus was preparing to enter Jerusalem, we're told that he summons two disciples. He sends them to go and find a donkey and bring it to him. Two unnamed disciples. They are called to perform one of the most mundane of tasks, go and find a donkey and bring it to him. So we even, even told where to look for that donkey and what to expect when they got there. Uh, it seems to me it would suggest almost that Jesus had already scouted out the place and likely had contact with the donkey's owner. Again, the text I was working with talked about the donkey's owner, the text you heard this morning said that there was a crowd of people, a group of people that saw him. In any event, it was a mundane task. Yet it was something that had to be done. Someone had to fetch the donkey. Imagine years later, those two disciples trying to explain the significance of their donkey fetching ministry. Well, maybe the omission of their names from the story reflects how they might have felt about it. So the question that we might be moved to ask today, why even bother including this part of the story in the narrative? It has, it has to be more than just Phil. I think it's pretty safe to say the gospel writer was not working on word count. So why do you think that aspect of the story was included? Well, could it be, could it be an example of how God's purposes can be found even in the most mundane and ordinary of tasks. A mundane event turned into a moment of revelation. A number of commentators have suggested that's a reasonable possibility. Other commentators suggest that the appearance of the person questioning the disciples or the people questioning the disciples, as Jesus had predicted, was seen as an affirmation of the disciples of God's work going on around them. 
even in the midst of the most ordinary tasks. So when asked, why are you doing this? The unnamed disciples were told simply, well, Jesus told us to go fetch the donkey. Now what, if anything, does that have to do with us? By turning this mundane and ordinary task into something special, into an encounter with the divine, if you will, we're reminded that even everyday tasks in our lives can be places in which God speaks to us too. As, as we put our hands to work in the everyday humdrum of life, making a meal, uh, washing dishes, mowing a lawn, balancing our books, or even fetching a donkey, we can get a glimpse of God's presence. And in that process, we can be taught an aspect of God's love just as the disciples were. Martin Luther put it this way once, Martin Luther King. If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should, street, he should sweep streets, even as Michelangelo painted, or as Beethoven composed music, or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all of the hosts of heaven and earth will pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well, or who did her job well, whatever the case. Maybe, maybe in those moments of our everyday existence, we'll hear someone asking, why are you doing this? Why are you mowing the church lawn? Or why did you choose nursing or teaching? I wonder sometimes if we have any sense that God has called us to these everyday tasks of life as an expression of ministry. I'm sure some do feel that way, especially nurses and teachers, maybe even on occasion preachers, maybe even while mowing lawns or tending the garden, all partners in maintaining God's creation. I'm reminded of the story of the pastor who uh, paid a, a social call, a pastoral visitation on Margaret. <clears throat> and he found Margaret working in the garden. And he said, hey, hi, Margaret, how are you doing? What are you doing there? She says, well, me and God were weeding the garden. He said, you and God? Well, of course, she said, you should have seen it before he was trying, before God was trying to do it all by himself. <laughs> so back to the story. The disciples returned with the donkey. I think we can safely assume that they were on hand to follow the processional of Jesus into Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not a large city. Biblical scholars Marcus Borg and John Dominic Croson, Croson tell us that the procession with Jesus is parading in the town on a donkey through one back gate in the town. On the other side of town, Pilate is parading in on a war horse. He's accompanied by a squadron or two of battle-hardened Roman soldiers. How many people do you suppose took part in a procession with Jesus into Jerusalem? It's really kind of hard to tell. Probably, probably less than a hearty group of children wandering around the sanctuary waving palms on a Palm Sunday. If more than a handful or so over and above that little band of disciples had been following Jesus around, into the city that day, it would likely have drawn some attention by the Roman garrisons, or at the very least, the temple police. The, juxt the juxtaposition of those two processions would have set up quite a contrast, say, Borg and Crossan. One came as an expression of military occupation, whose goal was to make sure that oppressed people did not find deliverance. It approached the city using horses, and brandishing weapons, proclaiming the power of empire. You can bet Pilate was being acclaimed by the crowd. They'd pay hell to pay if, uh, if he wasn't. The other procession was quite a contrast, using a donkey, laying down cloaks and branches along the road. This one was coming in the name of the Lord, quietly and profoundly, proclaiming the peaceful reign of God. 
The Bible doesn't tell us about Pilate's parade or what they shouted at all, but you, you can bet that it wasn't blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our ancestor David. That would have been treason. Treason was punishable by torture followed by execution on a cross. Do you think anyone in Pilate's parade heard about Jesus' parade? Heard what the crowd had shouted about Jesus? Probably not, at least not right away. Now, one of the dangers of this story is that because we've handed out palm branches to little children for so many years and smiled at their embarrassed cuteness as they wander the aisles of the church waving palms, we forget that there may be something more than simply remembering a long dead story going on and being sentimental about childhood. When I served as the pastor at Vancouver UCC, I delighted in being able to lead a parade of the children waving the palm branches through the sanctuary and out into the parking lot. <laughs> we had such a great time. They were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. That was the fun part of the celebration. The triumphant entry and fulfillment of scripture declaring that a new order was coming. But of course, that part of the story is colored by the rest of the story. And you know the rest of the story. Every year at this time, those joyful shouts of Hosanna turn into shouts of crucify by the end of the week. It's a story showing how fickle people can be, how the presence of Jesus can evoke a range of responses. It's a story filled with ambiguity. It's helpful that we who know the story of what occurs should also understand our place within that story. Aren't we a part of that crowd? In some ways, we're donkey fetchers. And in some ways, we wave our branches and we gather in hope. In other ways, despite our enthusiastic response, we too will lose our way with Jesus. We too will desert, betray, hide, and become part of the crucify crowd. We may not want to, but we will. That's the risk. That's what the story is reminding us. Isn't that how we live our lives? With a strange mixture of belief and skepticism, with, with a paradoxical ability to do both things which are good and bad, usually not even fully aware of which is which. <coughs> we live as people celebrating God's love, yet denying God's place in our lives. Jesus knows that and rides on anyway. Jesus travels towards the cross, towards his death, towards his resurrection to break through our fickleness, and by doing so declares God's love and inclusion of all of us in God's life. For me, the gathering on Palm Sunday shows the other side of the coin of our spiritual life, to the low and mundane task of donkey fetching, if you will, along with the times that we encounter God as a gathered community. Not unlike running to the roadside to see Jesus, we come and, and we gather here in worship and sing our hosannas because Jesus is present with us. <coughs> Even in the midst of our fickleness, accepting our praise. The hope that we find in the story of the donkey fetchers and of the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem is that Jesus is with us, alongside us, and remains with us through the good and the bad, through the less than satisfactory. Jesus is here with us as we go about our everyday tasks, washing dishes, mowing lawns, fetching donkeys, Jesus is here as we gather together to celebrate, not because we're worthy in any way of his presence, but because he chooses to do so out of love. How can we imagine this as our story? The key to all of this, I think, is that when we hear this story, we know it's a story for us. 
At the end of the story, Jesus is utterly alone. So too, at the end of the story, we also feel alone. That happens when we feel alone. When that happens, we can know that God understands and is present alongside us. Fourth century theologian Athanasius, speaking of the incarnation that reaches its climax in the crucifixion, <laughs> said that God becomes like us in Jesus so that we can become like God. And 1,200 years later, Martin Luther described the cross as the divine exchange where Jesus takes our life and our lot that we may enjoy his righteousness and victory. And 500 years after that, indeed on, on this very Sunday as we proclaim the word in this congregation, the story continues, the story of God's decision to not hold back and watch to see what we might do on our own, but instead to get involved take matters into the divine hands to join God's own self to us and completely so that we might live and die and live again in hope and courage. That's the story we tell today. The story of this week's dramatic reading, the story of God's passionate and relentless quest to redeem each and all of us in love. And if our preaching can introduce the story and invite others to see it as their own story, if they can look ahead to an open future of freedom and possibility, it is enough. More than enough. Now, does anyone know where I can go fetch a donkey? And all of God's people say together, Amen. Friends, I invite you to pray with me. O holy God of hope and courage and new life, we, your people, come together while apart. We come together in our homes and in your hearts as your people, and we give you thanks. O God, on this joyous day, we lift to you the ability to have some of your people about 10 feet apart in your holy space. And Lord, we look forward to continuing to be able to grow, to continuing to share our presence with each other, and to encourage one another. Lord, we lift today so many joys and concerns that are on our hearts. And we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Well, God, today we come together 
and lift the joys of this faith community at First United Methodist Church here in Port Angeles. As the sun came out this week, Lord, we could, he we could feel the smiles even if we couldn't see them on people's masked faces. We're so grateful for the spring, for a new season, and for new opportunities that are presented to us here in Port Angeles and around our community. Lord, we also lift to you those we know who are struggling here, those who need to be surrounded by your comfort and your strength as they manage their burdens. Help us to come together during this difficult time and to know, God, that we together are your community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh Lord, today as we look out from ourselves into our bigger world, we lift prayers of joy and our concerns for our country. Oh God, we give you thanks for all that it means for us to live in freedom, to share our voices, to celebrate our diversities, to raise our families. And God, we raise prayers, prayers for those who are struggling, prayers for communities who have been affected by violence, by threats. Oh God, just as we engage in our mundane tasks, help us to continue to reach out and provide strength to grow one by one locally and know that that reaches so far beyond. We pray for our leaders that they may seek ways of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Oh God, this day we lift prayers for our world. We give thanks for the new birds, for salmon returning to our waters, for knowing more about the lands that we are on than we have in our past. Oh Lord, we are so grateful for the diversity in our planet and for the way you weave us, your people, together. And God, as we together as a global church celebrate this, this Sunday of passion, and palms. We lift to you prayers for congregations who've experienced violence. Let us continue to respond with your love, with your courage, and with your hope, trusting in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Oh God, we bring to you all the things on our hearts and our minds the things that make us smile, and the things that make us weep. And we raise to you these prayers, taking back the strength that you give. As we come together to pray that ancient prayer you taught us so long ago, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Oh, friends, during this time apart, we have remained very blessed. And as we reflect on the scriptures that have been interpreted and preached and sung and prayed over, we reflect on the ways that God has gifted us and the ways we can give back. We encourage you to continue to maintain giving of your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service, and your witness in the ways that God presents to you this week. 
let us lift a prayer over all of these offerings. O oh God, bless us, your people, that we may continue to spread the love you have given us and the blessings to our community and our world. Bless these gifts given in your name today and throughout this week, that they may reach those you know, God, are hurting the most, are lost, and need your blessings. Multiply these gifts so that they may bring your hope and your healing and your courage through the most mundane tasks. For that brings us the sacredness of your divine blessings. Amen. Let his will enfold you. 
Thank you.